My dad was and still is my hero. I'm sure it sounds just like another worn out cliche, and hell, it might be. But it is very important to me that you remember this piece of information because, otherwise, all the things that I'm going to tell you about, all the actions I've taken, will make me seem like a total lunatic. He was an anthropologist by trade, and you could tell from the moment you met him. Even as young as I was, I knew that my dad loved people. He was fascinated by them, and he adored everything about them. It was woven into the dorky Hawaiian dad shirts he wore when he threw spontaneous backyard barbecues, tucked into his palm as he enthusiastically shook hands with every barista and bank teller he met, and etched into the crinkles of his eyes as he let out another boisterous laugh, the sort of laugh that made everyone else in the area want to laugh with him. People, it seems, loved him too. He wrote a lot of books, and apparently his personality shone even in writing, because they sold incredibly well. It was after the smashing success of one book in particular, one discussing folk legends in our home state of Colorado, that he decided we would buy the vacation home. God, it seems bitterly ironic looking back on it now, but we'll get to that. The vacation home was in a tiny Welsh town called Arfordir. It was, as the Welsh name suggests, on the sea, and the town lined a semicircular divot in the country's coastline, flanked on either side by craggy cliffs. Only a short distance out from the beach, approximately where the center of the circle would be if it were completed, there was a tiny island. It was scarcely more than a large rock, harboring little besides a couple of small grottos and a smattering of gulls' nests. It was called Morgan's Isle. I only ever got to spend a couple of summers at the house, but I remember those summers very fondly. My dad was deeply interested in the area, not only because of his appreciation for Welch culture, or what little remained after the gentrification of the area, but also because of some of the town's more unique attractions. Two in particular stand out to me as I reflect on it, and both involved the island. If you were outside at night, or when a dense fog had blanketed the town, you could hear a low, haunting melody rolling in off the sea. It was like someone playing the flute, resonant and mournful, far away across the water. My dad always thought it was the wind, catching in the cracks and crevices of Morgan's Isle and flowing back out across the water, friction from the sea-soaked rocks producing the ghostly howl. During the day, he said, the sounds of the town drowned it out. But at night, we would sit together on the back porch of the house and listen to the island sing across the inky sea. From our porch, it was also possible to observe the other phenomenon. If you looked out towards the island on a clear night, it was possible to see small, glittering points of light drifting over the dark water. They typically appeared in pairs, and they seemed to dip and swell as if riding atop the waves. My dad thought that it was a trick of the moonlight, perhaps an unusual reflection from something on the island or the shore. And he thought they were beautiful, like diamonds drifting on the sea, he said. And I looked up at him, stars in my eyes, and agreed. I was only nine when he disappeared. He had decided that he was going to go fishing for the day. We had a small boat, and he went out on it pretty frequently, leaving in the mid-morning, not returning until the last dregs of sunlight were slipping from the sky. Usually he would let me come with, and I begged to go that day too, but he wouldn't let me. I'm still not sure why. Maybe I'd been particularly clingy for the day's proceeding, or maybe he was planning to go out and do something dangerous that morning. I don't know. But I do know that, as darkness fell that evening, he didn't come back. And he never did again. 
They found the boat, bashed up against the cliffs a few miles down the coast from Arfadir, but no sign of dead. While accidents like this were uncommon in the area, they were not unheard of, and it was ultimately written off as an accidental drowning. They trawled the area for a while, looking for his body, but nothing turned up. And after the worst plane ride of our lives, my mom and I had to bury an empty casket. We didn't go back to the vacation home after that. We were all right financially, as my dad had left us a sizable chunk of savings to supplement my mom's income. But we couldn't face going back to where it all had happened. At the same time, though, my mom couldn't bear to get rid of the place. And so it sat, falling into disrepair for 11 years, until a few days ago. I recently turned 20, and after having something of an early life crisis, I decided it was time to get some closure. My mom was not a big fan of my decision. If it was up to her, we would just let the house rot to nothing and never think about it again. But I had made up my mind. And before she could mount any real effort to stop me, I was bound to Cardiff Airport. I opted to check into Arfadir's small inns rather than attempting to stay at the house. This turned out to be a smart decision, as when I arrived at our old vacation home, it was in a state of severe disrepair. Being so close to the sea, weathering had taken its toll on the home's exterior, and the once well-kept garden had turned into a tangle of unkempt grass and thorny weeds. The interior was largely preserved, save for one room which had flooded through a hole in the roof, but a thick layer of dust had settled over what little furnishings had remained when we'd vacated the place. Evening was fast approaching, and I decided that it would be best if I returned to the inn to decide what to do with the place. As I was pushing through the door, I turned back one last time, half expecting to see my dad sitting on the stairs behind me. But no one was there. After a restless night, I decided to spend the next day, yesterday, out on the water. I bought some supplies from a dingy little tackle shop and slid into a rented boat in the harbor. As I chugged out into the sea, I had this eerie feeling that I was reliving my dad's last day. Peering across the glittering waves, my eyes snagged on a narrow cave, tucked into the jagged flank of Morgan's Isle. I started steering towards it for a moment, but stopped myself. What was I doing? I'd seen people try to approach the cave before, and a patrol boat would always stop you, saying that it wasn't safe for public access. Liable to collapse, they'd say. A tiny part of my brain whispered that they probably hadn't checked there all those years ago. They would have thought it was too dangerous, not worth the risk of searching. Maybe. Just maybe. No, 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 I shook my head, as if to knock the idiotic thoughts out of my brain. I was there to get closure, not open some silly, dangerous, and likely fruitless investigation. I found myself a good spot a little ways past the island instead, and settled in for a day of fishing. I didn't end up catching anything. We had never caught much when I was younger anyway, and the years in between had taken their toll on the already dwindling fish population. Besides, I could never quite completely wipe the thoughts of the cave from my mind. Before I knew it, the long, uneasy afternoon had slipped away into the evening, and darkness spread quickly across the sky like a stain. As I rounded the island, I could see no other silhouettes against the shimmering lights of the town. I was alone, on the water, and I was so close to the cave. I dragged my palms down my face, 
I knew I wouldn't get a wink of sleep if I didn't at least check. And, besides, now was the perfect opportunity, with no patrol boats crawling around. Hidden by the darkness of the open sea, I anchored the boat as close as I could to the tiny, rocky beach at the cave's mouth and splashed my way to the entrance, wincing as the icy water soaked into my sneakers. Standing on the gravel beach, I fumbled in my pocket. I was relieved to feel the clink of my keyring against my fingertips. Pulling it out, I pressed the button on the small flashlight that I kept clipped to the ring, and its weak beam cut through the darkness ahead of me. The small comfort that the light afforded me was dashed as I heard scuffling from behind some large stones just a few feet ahead. My hand shook as I pointed the flashlight toward the source of the sound, and I stumbled back as a figure moved from behind the rocks. Dad? It had come out as a question, but as my disbelieving eyes flickered over the man in front of me, I was sure it was him. He was much older and far scruffier than he was when I'd last seen him, and he was still somewhat obscured by the shadows of the cave's entrance. Still, I felt certain it was my dad. My heart leapt in elation, and I stumbled forward, slipping on the loose, wet gravel in my haste to embrace him. To my dismay, however, he started backwards, jerking out of the way of my open arms and slipping backwards, further into the cave. There's no time, Carter. His voice was rough and strangled with disuse. What? He jerked his head backwards, indicating for me to follow him into the cave. I was so stunned by the strangeness of the interaction, by his sudden appearance and by his form retreating further into the darkness of the cave, that I followed without question. At that moment, it seemed like the only thing I could do. While his strides seemed quick and practiced, mine were rendered unsteady by the slick rock beneath me. He was still just ahead of me, just on the edge of my flashlight beam but I had to pick up my halted, slippery pace to keep up with him as he continued to press on. There's no time for reunions yet. I promise you, all of that will come in due time, but for now, I just need you to trust me. I was out of breath from our rapid pace, and though questions burned at the tip of my tongue, I wasn't able to vocalize them. The walls of the cave seemed slightly closer now, and my claustrophobia built into a lump in my throat, further blocking any attempt at communication I might make. Years ago, the day I disappeared, I discovered a ritual site in the back of this cave. He explained, and I staggered onward. I don't remember what happened between then and two days ago. All I know is that I woke up here, with the ritual site glowing around me. I managed to find out the date from a passing boat. I don't know what happened, Carter. And I'm so sorry for leaving you for so long. But I do know that something is happening tonight. In this cave. I don't know what will happen if we don't stop it. But I don't want to find out, and I need your help. My head was spinning with all the new information. He was still moving quickly in front of me, and stunned as I was, I lost my focus for a moment, and with it, my footing. My toe caught the small edge on the ground beneath me, and I tripped, halting for a moment as I caught myself on my hands, scraping myself badly. However, it was not the pain that I noticed. The moment I had stopped, so had my dad. I stood, slowly, and took another step forward. So did he. I took a few more, and he followed. But each time I stopped, he would too. 
It was as though he was determined to stay exactly as far from me as he was currently. Just close enough to still be visible. Just far enough to avoid the full power of my feeble flashlight beam. My blood ran cold. Carter, come on. He said gruffly, urgency in something else that I now know to have been hunger distorting his tone. We have to hurry. That had been the point all along, hadn't it? To hurry me along, feed me lots of information all at once, give me no time to think. But now I was thinking. It was a plausible story, sure. My dad had been a curious man, and if he had seen the same opportunity I had, it was certainly possible that he would have tried to explore the cave as well. An anthropologist would have been intrigued by a perceived ritual site. And, if something supernatural had indeed happened, it could explain his disappearance in the manner that he had described. But, something still bugged me. As I mentioned, my dad had always loved people. Now, the first person he's seen in 11 years even if those 11 years were a timeless blur, arrives at the cave and he spends no time greeting them? Not even when that person is his own son. It didn't seem right. I tensed my hand around my keychain and in one smooth motion, moved forward and focused the pale beam right on the figure in front of me. He jolted backward as quickly as he could, but it wasn't fast enough. Not this time. And I finally saw him for what he was. Sure, he looked a lot like my dad, an aged up, banged up version of him, tailor made as if he'd been unconscious in a cave for 11 years. An excellent copy. But I could also see why he'd been avoiding the light. In the detail afforded by the dim light, I could see the way his limbs seemed slightly too long the way his shoulders didn't quite slot in their sockets, the way his teeth seemed just a bit too large for his mouth, and his eyes, Christ, they were the same color as my dad's, sure, but, but that's where the resemblance ended. They were empty, glassy, artificial, like the false eyes they stick in taxidermied animals, a poor imitation of the real thing. My dad was an anthropologist, and I know a person when I see one. This wasn't. The next few minutes are a blur in my memory. I remember sprinting back in the direction I'd come, slipping and sliding on the algae-coated stone beneath me. I could hear him chasing me, and worse, I could hear more of them behind him scampering through the cave on what sounded to me like wet, slippery, clawed hands and feet. As I ran, I kicked rocks backwards, hoping they would slow their progress. I guess it must have worked, because the next thing I knew I had flung myself into my boat and gunned it away from the island, not even bothering to look back and see how close an escape it had been. This brings me to today. As you might expect, I didn't sleep a wink. I spent the whole night researching, trying to figure out exactly what it was that happened to me. From what I've put together, it is likely that the first part of the story I told was true. My dad probably did see the cave, seek the opportunity to explore it under the cover of darkness and venture deep into it, hoping to discover a hidden anthropological treasure. But I don't think he found anything human in that horrible place. And I am certain now, even more than I was, that he is dead. Do you know where the name Morgan's Isle comes from? I certainly didn't. Before my midnight research session, I had always assumed that it was just named after an important figure in the area like Jacksonville or Pennsylvania in the US. 
It turns out, though, that this is not the case. I doubt that many of the current residents of Aphrodir would pick up on the name's significance. Hardly any of them are Welsh, and fewer are old enough or rooted enough in the area to remember any of the legends attached to it. As it turns out, a Morgan, or Morgan, is a Welsh term for a creature that entices men into its lair, usually with its beauty or enchanting voice, in order to drown or consume them. In the US, we might refer to this creature as a siren. I believe that it is likely these are the creatures that I encountered in the cave last night. And, if this is the case, there is no doubt in my mind that they are responsible for the disappearances of a number of visitors and locals alike over the years, including my poor father. As I am telling you this, I am sitting on the back porch of the old vacation home. My flight leaves tomorrow morning, and I have one more night in the grubby little inn up the road. But something called me back here, telling me to look out over the darkened sea one last time. I sincerely hope that it wasn't the sound that brought me here, that beautiful, achingly sorrowful timber that echoes up the bluffs and draws me closer, sounding so much more melodic than it did all those years ago. Leaning in, I can see the flecks of light on the water again, tipping hypnotically up and down as waves roll by beneath them. I feel sick to my stomach. My dad was wrong. They aren't anything like diamonds. Looking at them now, I can see them for what they are. Fake. Dead. Empty. Like taxidermy.